Issa Whitney, brother of the late Elias Whitney, D.D., principal of the Theological College of St. George's, was much addicted to opium. The habit grew upon him, as I understand, from some foolish freak when he was at college, for having read de Quincey's description of his dreams and sensations, he had drenched his tobacco with laudanum in an attempt to produce the same effects. He found, as so many more have done, that the practice is easier to attain than to get rid of, and for many years he continued to be a slave to the drug, an object of mingled horror and pity to his friends and relatives. I can see him now with yellow, pasty face, drooping lids and pinpoint pupils, all huddled in a chair, the wreck and ruin of a noble man. One night, it was in June 89, there came a ring to my bell, about the hour when a man gives his first yawn and glances at the clock. I sat up in my chair, and my wife laid her needlework down in her lap and made a little face of disappointment. A patient, said she. You'll have to go out. I groaned, for I was newly come back from a weary day. We heard the door open, a few hurried words, and then quick steps upon the linoleum. Our own door flew open, and a lady clad in some dark-coloured stuff with a black veil entered the room. You will excuse my calling so late, she began, and then suddenly losing her self-control, she ran forward, threw her arms about my wife's neck, and sobbed upon her shoulder. Oh! I'm in such trouble, she cried. I do so want a little help. Why, said my wife, pulling up her veil, it is Kate Whitney. How you startled me, Kate. I had not an idea who you were when you came in. I didn't know what to do, so I came straight to you. That was always the way. Folk who were in grief came to my wife like birds to a lighthouse. It was very sweet of you to come. Now you must have some wine and water, and sit here comfortably and tell us all about it. Or should you rather that I sent James off to bed? Oh, no, no. I want the doctor's advice and help, too. It's about Isa. He has not been home for two days. I'm so frightened about him. It was not the first time that she had spoken to us of her husband's trouble, to me as a doctor, to my wife as an old friend and school companion. We soothed and comforted her by such words as we could find. Did she know where her husband was? Was it possible that we could bring him back to her? It seems that it was. She had the surest information that of late he had, when the fit was on him, made use of an opium den in the farthest east of the city. Hitherto his orgies had always been confined to one day, and he had come back, twitching and shattered in the evening. But now the spell had been upon him eight and forty hours and he lay there doubtless among the dregs of the docks, breathing in the poison or sleeping off the effects. There he was to be found, she was sure of it, at the bar of gold in Upper Swandham Lane. But what was she to do? How could she, a young and timid woman, make her way into such a place and pluck her husband out from among the ruffians who surrounded him? There was the case, and of course there was but one way out of it, might I not escort her to this place? And then as a second thought, why should she come at all? I was Issa Whitney's medical adviser, and as such I had influence over him. I could manage it better if I were alone. I promised her on my word that I would send him home in a cab within two hours if he were indeed at the address which she had given me. And so, in ten minutes, I had left my armchair and cheery sitting-room behind me, and was speeding eastward in handsome on a strange errand as it seemed to me at the time, though the future only could show how strange it was to be. But there was no great difficulty in the first stage of my adventure. Upper Swandham Lane is a vile alley, looking behind the high wharves which line the north side of the river to the east of London Bridge. Between a slop shop and a gin shop, approached by a steep flight of steps leading down to a black gap like the mouth of a cave, I found the den of which I was in search. Ordering my cab to wait, I passed down the steps, worn hollow in the centre by the ceaseless tread of drunken feet, and by the light of a flickering oil lamp above the door, I found the latch and made my way into a long, low room, thick and heavy with the brown opium smoke, 
and terraced with wooden berths like the forecastle of an emigrant ship. Through the gloom, one could dimly catch a glimpse of bodies lying in strange, fantastic poses, bowed shoulders, bent knees, heads thrown back and chins pointing upward, with here and there a dark and lacklustre eye turned upon the newcomer. Out of the black shadows there glimmered little red circles of light, now bright, now faint, as the burning poison waxed or waned in the bowls of the metal pipes. The most lay silent, but some muttered to themselves, and others talked together in a strange, low, monotonous voice, their conversation coming in gushes, and then suddenly tailing off into silence, each mumbling out his own thoughts and paying little heed to the words of his neighbour. At the farther end was a small brazier of burning charcoal, beside which on a three-legged wooden stool there sat a tall, thin old man, with his jaw resting upon his two fists and his elbows upon his knees, staring into the fire. As I entered, a sallow Malay attendant had hurried up with a pipe for me and a supply of the drug, beckoning me to an empty berth. Thank you, I have not come to stay, said I. There is a friend of mine here, Mr. Issa Whitney, and I wish to speak with him. There was a movement and an exclamation from my right, and peering through the gloom, I saw Whitney, pale, haggard, and unkempt, staring out at me. My God, it's Watson, said he. He was in a pitiable state of reaction, with every nerve in a twitter. I say, Watson, what o'clock is it? Nearly eleven. Of what day? Of Friday, June nineteenth. Good heavens, I thought it was Wednesday. It is Wednesday. What do you want to frighten a chap for? He sank his face into his arms and began to sob in a high treble key. I tell you that it is Friday, man. Your wife has been waiting this two days for you. You should be ashamed of yourself. So I am. But you've got mixed, Watson, for I've only been here a few hours. Three pipes, four pipes, I forget how many, but I'll go home with you. I wouldn't frighten Kate, poor little Kate. Give me your hand. Have you a, a cab? Yes, I have one waiting. Then I shall go in it. But I must owe something. Find what I owe, Watson. I'm all off colour. I can do nothing for myself. I walked down the narrow passage between the double row of sleepers, holding my breath to keep out the vile, stupefying fumes of the drug, and looking about for the manager. As I passed the tall man who sat by the brazier, I felt a sudden pluck at my skirt, and a low voice whispered, Walk past me and then look back at me. The words fell quite distinctly upon my ear. I glanced down. They could only have come from the old man at my side, and yet he sat now as absorbed as ever, very thin, very wrinkled, bent with age, an opium pipe dangling down from between his knees, as though it had dropped in sheer lassitude from his fingers. I took two steps forward and looked back. It took all my self-control to prevent me from breaking out into a cry of astonishment. He had turned his back so that none could see him but I. His form had filled out, his wrinkles were gone, the dull eyes had regained their fire and there, sitting by the fire and grinning at my surprise, was none other than Sherlock Holmes. He made a slight motion to me to approach him, and instantly, as he turned his face half round to the company once more, subsided into a doddering, loose-lipped senility. Holmes, I whispered, what on earth are you doing in this den? As low as you can, he answered. I have excellent ears. If you would have the great kindness to get rid of that sottish friend of yours, I should be exceedingly glad to have a little talk with you. I have a cab outside. Then pray send him home in it. You may safely trust him, for he appears to be too limp to get into any mischief. I should recommend you also to send a note by the cabman to your wife, to say that you have thrown in your lot with me. If you will wait outside, I shall be with you in five minutes. It was difficult to refuse any of Sherlock Holmes's requests, for they were always so exceedingly definite, and put forward with such a quiet air of mastery. I felt, however, that when Whitney was once confined in the cab, my mission was practically accomplished, 
and for the rest I could not wish anything better than to be associated with my friend in one of those singular adventures which were the normal condition of his existence. In a few minutes I had written my note, paid Whitney's bill, led him out to the cab, and seen him driven through the darkness. In a very short time, a decrepit figure had emerged from the opium den, and I was walking down the street with Sherlock Holmes. For two streets he shuffled along with a bent back and an uncertain foot. Then, glancing quickly round, he straightened himself out and burst into a hearty fit of laughter. <laughs> I suppose, Watson, said he, that you imagine that I have added opium smoking to cocaine injections, and that all the other little weaknesses on which you have favoured me with your medical views. I was certainly surprised to find you there, but not more so than I to find you. I came to find a friend, and I to find an enemy. An enemy? Yes, one of my natural enemies, or shall I say my natural prey. Briefly, Watson, I am in the midst of a very remarkable inquiry, and I have hoped to find a clue in the incoherent ramblings of these sots, as I have done before now. Had I been recognized in that den, my life would not have been worth an hour's purchase, for I have used it before now for my own purposes, and the rascally Lasker who runs it has sworn to have vengeance upon me. There is a trap door at the back of that building, near the corner of Paul's Wharf, which could tell some strange tales of what has passed through it upon the moonless nights. What? You do not mean bodies? Aye, bodies, Watson. We should be rich men if we had a thousand pounds for every poor devil who has been done to death in that den. It is the vilest murder trap on the whole riverside, and I fear that Neville St. Clair has entered it never to leave it more. But our trap should be here. He put his two forefingers between his teeth and whistled shrilly, a signal which was answered by a similar whistle from the distance, followed shortly by the rattle of wheels and the clink of horses' hoofs. Now, Watson, said Holmes, as a tall dog cart, dashed up through the gloom, throwing out two golden tunnels of yellow light from its side lanterns. You'll come with me, won't you? If I can be of use. Oh, a trusty comrade is always of use, and a chronicler still more so. My room at the Cedars is a double-bedded one. The Cedars? Yes, that is Mr. St. Clair's house. I'm staying there while I conduct the inquiry. Where is it then? Near Lee in Kent. We have a seven-mile drive before us. But I am all in the dark. Of course you are. You'll know all about it presently. Jump up here. All right, John. We shall not need you. Here's half a crown. Look out for me tomorrow about eleven. Give her her head. So long, then. <laughs>